Jesus lived in perfect integrity so that he might die then as our substitute. He offered up his record of perfect obedience and he took our record of guilt at the cross. And because of this, he was raised in glory and he will reign in eternity. Welcome to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths. I'm Steve Hiller, glad you've tuned in today as we continue a message that we began last time. It's called God's King Must Reign. And Jonathan, all the way back in the book of 1 Kings, we still see scripture pointing us to Jesus Christ and what he has done, being reminded that he is the King of Kings. And it's so wonderful the ways in which the Old Testament does this for us. I think it does it does this positively and negatively. So we look at a king like Solomon, who had some very, very wonderful gifts and some very, very deep weaknesses and human frailties. And within Solomon, we do see a pointer to the great King of Kings, to the Lord Jesus Christ. But within Solomon's weakness, we also see why it is that we need Jesus to come, why it is we need Jesus to reign, because no human king can reign perfectly and thoroughly well and with real integrity. It takes the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we're going to find here in 1 Kings that our eyes are pointed to the Lord Jesus Christ, and we are drawn principally not to Solomon, but to Jesus himself. Why is that so significant, that Jesus ruled perfectly? Well, I think it's significant that Jesus lived perfectly because if he had been sinful like Solomon or sinful like you or sinful like me, he couldn't have paid the price of our sin at Calvary. And so the the perfection of the Lord Jesus in his character and in his work in all that he is and all that he does is so essential for our salvation. And that's one of the things that we're going to be giving some consideration to as we look at Solomon and how he points us to the Lord Jesus. Well, grab your Bible, and if you can, join us in the book of 1 Kings. We're in chapters 1 and 2 today as we continue a message called God's King Must Reign. Here is Jonathan. God's appointed leaders. As great men and women of faith, they are mortal, and unless the Lord Jesus should return first, they will die. Their era of influence will come to an end, but God's purposes and God's plans, they rest on one set of shoulders and one set only, the shoulders of his true and anointed king, his beloved son, the one who died and rose again, who ascended on high, who will come again in glory and who will reign for all eternity. God's kingdom advances despite the frailty of human leaders. Next, God's kingdom advances by his providence and his prompting. In human terms, Nathan the prophet and Bathsheba, the wife of uh, David, the mother of Solomon, they saved the day. Adonijah has gathered up his group in secret at a place called the Serpent's Stone, rather fitting, isn't it? Conspiratorial, verse 9, and has made a great sacrifice there and staged his own coronation as king. And this was done, it was done out of the sight, out of the earshot of David. But the old prophet Nathan somehow heard about it. The Lord caused him to hear about it. And and he went straight to David's wife, the mother of Solomon, verse 11. Then Nathan said to Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, have you not heard that Adonijah, the son of Haggith, has become king and David, our Lord, doesn't know it? Now, therefore, come, let me give you advice that you may save your own life and the life of Solomon, your son. Go in at once to King David and say to him, did you not, my Lord, the king, swear to your servant, saying, Solomon, your son, shall reign after me and he shall sit on my throne. Why then is Adonijah king? Then while you are still speaking with the king, I also will come in after you and confirm your words. Now Adonijah, he seemed to have a pretty good shot at making this thing work. Remember, he had, he had chariots and, and, and he had horsemen. He had 50 men to run before him. He had the looks. He had the lineage And he had powerful people behind him, even Abiathar the priest. To to challenge him at this point was pretty risky. He had some power. He had some momentum. Nathan knew that Bathsheba's life and Solomon's life were now at stake. But he also knew that the Lord's favor rested upon Solomon. 
He knew of an oath, not recorded in Scripture, but referred to here that David had taken that Solomon would indeed be king. And, and Nathan took that to be the Lord's will and the Lord's revelation in this matter. And so he acted. He acted boldly. He approached Bathsheba, and she too was willing to act. There was wisdom in the approach. Bathsheba, she had access to the ailing king. Probably not many people had access. Nathan would only follow as she led. And even with David's ear, they, they couldn't, I guess, be confident. They couldn't be sure that the old frail man actually had the power and the sway to make things happen anymore. But they knew that they were right. They knew that their cause was just. They knew that they were in line with the will of God. They knew that they were on the right side of God's history. And so they took courage and they acted. They went before David and, and he heard them. And despite his frailty, he took swift action. It's fascinating just to observe, you know, how it is that God chooses to do things. As we read the big story of Scripture, we see again and again that God seems to do things what we would consider to be the hard way. Have you ever noticed that? <laughs> I mean, within the sovereignty of God, the drama of First Kings chapter 1, it isn't strictly speaking necessary. I mean, he didn't need to order things in this way. He could have prevented all of it, but he allowed the plot he allowed the ungodly machinations. He allowed the time of pressure, of uncertainty, of danger. And within that time, he prompted one key servant and then another key servant to take some bold action. And he was pleased to use their action for his greater purposes. They were acting, yes, at risk to themselves. It was a risky thing. They were going against the tide of politics and against power there was every chance, humanly speaking, that their initiative should fail and it should cost them dearly. But of course, all this, it, it comes down to the Lord. Jesus lived in perfect integrity so that he might die then as our substitute. He offered up his record of perfect obedience and he took our record of guilt at the cross. And because of this, he was raised in glory and he will reign in eternity. Welcome to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths. I'm Steve Hiller, glad you've tuned in today as we continue a message that we began last time. It's called God's King Must Reign. And Jonathan, all the way back in the book of 1 Kings, we still see scripture pointing us to Jesus Christ and what he has done, being reminded that he is the King of Kings. And it's so wonderful the ways in which the Old Testament does this for us. I think it does, it does this positively and negatively. So we look at a king like Solomon who had some very, very wonderful gifts and some very, very deep weaknesses and human frailties. And within Solomon, we do see a pointer to the great king of kings, to the Lord Jesus Christ. But within Solomon's weakness, we also see why it is that we need Jesus to come, why it is we need Jesus to reign, because no human king can reign perfectly and thoroughly well and with real integrity. It takes the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we're going to find here in 1 Kings that our eyes are pointed to the Lord Jesus Christ, and we are drawn principally not to Solomon, but to Jesus himself. Why is that so significant that Jesus ruled perfectly? Well, I think it's significant that Jesus lived perfectly because if he had been sinful like Solomon or sinful like you or sinful like me, he couldn't have paid the price of our sin at Calvary. And so the, the perfection of the Lord Jesus in his character and in his work in all that he is and all that he does is so essential for our salvation. And that's one of the things that we're going to be giving some consideration to as we look at Solomon and how he points us to the Lord Jesus. Well, grab your Bible, and if you can, join us in the book of 1 Kings. We're in chapters 1 and 2 today as we continue a message called God's King Must Reign. Here is Jonathan. God's appointed leaders. As great men and women of faith, they are mortal, and unless the Lord Jesus should return first, they will die. Their era of influence will come to an end, but God's purposes and God's plans, they rest on one set of shoulders and one set only, the shoulders of his true and anointed king, his beloved son. 
the one who died and rose again, who ascended on high, who will come again in glory and who will reign for all eternity. God's kingdom advances despite the frailty of human leaders. Next, God's kingdom advances by his providence and his prompting. In human terms, Nathan the prophet and Bathsheba, the wife of uh, David, the mother of Solomon, they save the day. Adonijah has gathered up his group in secret at a place called the Serpent's Stone, rather fitting, isn't it? Conspiratorial, verse 9, and has made a great sacrifice there and staged his own coronation as king. And this was done, it was done out of the sight, out of the earshot of David. But the old prophet Nathan somehow heard about it. The Lord caused him to hear about it. And, and he went straight to David's wife, the mother of Solomon, verse 11. Then Nathan said to Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, have you not heard that Adonijah, the son of Haggith, has become king and David, our Lord, doesn't know it? Now, therefore, come, let me give you advice that you may save your own life and the life of Solomon, your son. Go in at once to King David and say to him, did you not, my Lord, the king, swear to your servant, saying, Solomon, your son, shall reign after me and he shall sit on my throne. Why then is Adonijah king? Then while you are still speaking with the king, I also will come in after you and confirm your words. Now Adonijah, he seemed to have a pretty good shot at making this thing work. Remember, he had, he had chariots and, and, and he had horsemen. He had 50 men to run before him. He had the looks. He had the lineage and he had powerful people behind him, even Abiathar the priest. To, to challenge him at this point was pretty risky. He had some power. He had some momentum. Nathan knew that Bathsheba's life and Solomon's life were now at stake. But he also knew that the Lord's favor rested upon Solomon. He knew of an oath, not recorded in Scripture, but referred to here that David had taken that Solomon would indeed be king. And, and Nathan took that to be the Lord's will and the Lord's revelation in this matter. And so he acted. He acted boldly. He approached Bathsheba, and she too was willing to act. There was wisdom in the approach. Bathsheba, she had access to the ailing king. Probably not many people had access. Nathan would only follow as she led. And even with David's ear, they, they couldn't, I guess, be confident. They couldn't be sure that the old frail man actually had the power and the sway to make things happen anymore. But they knew that they were right. They knew that their cause was just. They knew that they were in line with the will of God. They knew that they were on the right side of God's history. And so they took courage and they acted. They went before David and, and he heard them. And despite his frailty, he took swift action. It's fascinating just to observe, you know, how it is that God chooses to do things. As we read the big story of Scripture, we see again and again that God seems to do things what we would consider to be the hard way. Have you ever noticed that? <laughs> I mean, within the sovereignty of God, the drama of First Kings chapter 1, it isn't, strictly speaking, necessary. I mean, he didn't need to order things in this way. He could have prevented all of it, but he allowed the plot. He allowed the ungodly machinations. He allowed the time of pressure, of uncertainty, of danger. And within that time, he prompted one key servant and, and then another key servant to take some bold action. And he was pleased to use their action for his greater purposes. They were acting, yes, at risk to themselves. It was a risky thing. They were going against the tide of politics and against power. There was every chance, humanly speaking, that their initiative should fail. And it should cost them dearly. But of course, all this, it, it comes down to the Lord. Nathan wouldn't have known anything about the plot had not the Lord ordered things in his providence in such a way that he should find out. David would not have given Nathan and Bathsheba a real hearing necessarily, had not the Lord moved his heart. David would not have had the remaining strength and perhaps even the clarity of mind to take action in response, had not the Lord strengthened his hand this one last time. And the action, it wouldn't have met with success, had the Lord not been in it. 
And so the Lord's very definitely the hero of the story here. But at the same time, he was pleased to use this circumstance to employ willing servants to do his bidding. It's worth noting the fact that Nathan the prophet and Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, were both rather out of the picture these days in the court of Israel. Their day of prominence was really some years back, back in, in the middle of 2 Samuel. We hadn't heard of them in the Bible story for quite a long period of time. But the Lord prompted Nathan, brought him out of retirement, as it were, prompted him. He saw the need to act, to intervene. He found a willing partner in Bathsheba. They, they took courage together, and, and then they took action. We see here the providence of God. We see his wisdom in using willing servants who will respond to his promptings and take bold action when needed. You know, this has happened again and again throughout the history of the people of God, the history of the church. We think of Martin Luther and his willingness to stand up at the time of the Reformation to a gospel-denying church, a powerful church. His willingness to put his reputation and his career and I guess his personal security on the line and to nail those 95 theses to the door of All Saints Church at Wittenberg in another context. We see it in the willingness, I think, of William Wilberforce to act out of biblical conviction concerning the wickedness of the slave trade in the British Empire and to stand up in his day to campaign to take unpopular action, to risk scorn, to risk loss, to do what was so clearly within the will of God, and we see how God used him. In every age, there will be the need for those who will respond to the promptings of God and follow the providence of God and take action for the sake of the gospel and the kingdom and the people of God. It may be in small ways, responding to that prompting of the Spirit, to speak to a friend about Jesus, to take an opportunity for the gospel. It may be on a larger scale to challenge false teaching in the church, to stand up for the people of God in the public square, to, to bear witness for Christ despite the scorn that may come. But Nathan, Bathsheba, they're an encouragement to us. They remind us that the Lord delights in using those who will rest upon his promises, who will trust in his sovereign plan, who will go against the tide, who will take bold action for the sake of the kingdom. They're, they're an encouragement to us. And they're a timely encouragement at that, timely for an age when bold and independent action grounded in faith and conviction will, I sense, be more and more needed story of 1 Kings will swiftly take us to the glory days of Solomon's reign. But to get there, we first needed the quiet action, the bold and the swift action, the faith-filled convictional action of Nathan and Bathsheba. And so here's a takeaway for me and a takeaway for you. When the need arises, when conviction from the Word of God drives us, when the Spirit may prompt us, would we be instruments in the Lord's hands to do His bidding for the sake of the kingdom? You're listening to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths, a message called God's King Must Reign, part of our series, Days of Glory. And if you joined us a little bit late, we're in the book of 1 Kings, looking at chapters 1 and 2 today. So grab a Bible, have it handy, as we'll get back to this message in just a moment. If you ever miss a broadcast, you can listen online. Come to EncounterTheTruth.org, and you can stream the program or download an MP3 for free. You can also listen if you have the Encounter the Truth app. It's a great way to listen on demand whenever it fits your schedule. You'll find the app at your favorite app store. Simply look for Encounter the Truth. All right, let's get back to the message. Again, here is Jonathan. God's kingdom, it advances by his prompting and his providence. Next, it advances through obedience to his word. Once Solomon is made king, his father has a few words to say to him. David doesn't have much time left at all now, but he wants to make sure that Solomon's rule and reign are established on a firm foundation. Notice it with me, chapter 2 and verse 1. When David's time to die drew near, he commanded Solomon his son, saying, I'm about to go the way of all the earth. Be strong 
and show yourself a man and keep the charge of the Lord your God walking in his ways and keeping his statutes, his commandments, his rules and his testimonies that is, as it is written in the law of Moses that you may prosper in all you do and wherever you may turn that the Lord may establish his word that he spoke concerning me saying if your sons pay close attention to their way to walk before me in faithfulness with all their heart and with all their soul you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. Now for David, these words of conviction were no doubt shaped by his own experience, his own story, his own failure. The great blot on David's life, as you know, was his affair with Bathsheba and the murder of her husband. And although David had experienced the Lord's grace and his favor, his forgiveness, David knew painfully the cost of compromise. He knew that the Lord requires faithfulness. So he called upon Solomon to heed the word of God, to walk in his ways, to keep his law. Success, success, it would mean nothing and it would be fleeting if it was not grounded in integrity and obedience. Solomon knew the lesson. He understood it. He followed it for a time. He, he actually taught it to others. But as we shall see, he fell spectacularly at the end. And it's a sobering lesson. No matter how impressive the leader or the servant of God, no matter how fruitful their service, no matter how much is achieved, it will crumble to nothing if it is not grounded in faithful obedience. It's a cautionary word for you and for me in our service of the Lord. Obedience comes first. Obedience matters. Obedience is the foundation. I was reading just this week the very sorry saga of the president of a large Christian university, very influential, very successful, very prominent, and all the rest. He brought this particular university to a place of wealth and success and so on, but there was no integrity, it turned out. The life behind the mask was a hypocritical mess and the former success it means absolutely nothing now it's a public scandal any good that was achieved for a time has now been undone as you and i serve the lord in kingdom work we've just got to take warning obedience has got to be the foundation obedience has got to be the core as we serve and we're tempted to cut corners to ignore sin to sidestep obedience to imagine that fruitfulness is all that matters and that fruitfulness will trump faithfulness in the end we need to take warning if we think along those lines we also need to take comfort here we need to take comfort because we know that david's words to solomon are only actually fulfilled in the life of his greater son, the Lord Jesus Christ, whose life was the one life that has ever been marked by perfect obedience. He was the one, the only one who has ever lived and perfectly kept the charge of verse 3 so that the promise of verse 4 might be fulfilled, that David should never lack a man on the throne. Jesus lived in perfect integrity, full obedience. And he did that so that he might die then as our substitute to pay the price of our unfaithfulness and our failure to live up to his perfect life. He offered up his record of perfect obedience and he took our record of guilt at the cross and because of this, he was raised in glory and he will reign in eternity. God's kingdom advances through obedience to his word. And finally, and very briefly as we close, God's kingdom advances in the judgment of his enemies. 
In chapter 2 of 1 Kings, we find Solomon's rule established. That's the main theme of the chapter. The point is repeated at the end of the two key sections of the chapter. It's really divided into two, and there's emphasis here. At verse 12, at the end of the first section of the chapter, and then we see it again at verse 46, at the end of the chapter. We don't have time to work through all the details of the narrative, but much of the focus here in the establishment of the reign of Solomon is actually on dealing with the enemies of the royal family. David, before he dies, calls Solomon to execute justice on two men who were guilty in his eyes. Concerning Joab, the son of Zeruiah, David has this instruction for Solomon, verse 6. 